All right, we are live. Welcome, What's ladies up? and gentlemen. Cosmographia Live. Still getting live. stuff set up here. Where am I at? Randall did confirm that just before the show. He is alive. He is alive. Look at that. Yes, yeah, so yeah, I had my pulse check just just less than an hour ago. Oh, okay, good. And they confirmed that you are in fact yes still alive. both arms okay well i have the home testing kit where you can test your own pulse just to, and then it has a little uh little light to come either red or green if it comes on green then you're alive okay but if it good. comes on red then you don't see it because you're dead yeah yeah okay got it so clever so mine was somewhere kind of a a pale brown <laughs> kind of between <laughs> well All hello right. out there Thanks for joining us on a Wednesday. Yes, joining us on a Wednesday. We are going to be doing questions and answers. So if you guys have questions, get start, get them rolling in. Uh, meanwhile, Randall, what do you got? You guys have some special stuff planned coming up? What's going on? No, we're, we're dispensing with all the special stuff. Oh, we're okay, just, no special you know, stuff. We're going to just pretty do much normal things. Average stuff. Just, just normal. <laughs> yeah, average boring things. You got Mike so. in charge of your... Uh, you yeah, got a normal guy in charge of the planning. <laughs> he can charge <laughs> everything from here out. So <laughs> from this point on, there, there will be nothing of any exceptional nature. Or <clears throat> Well, let's see. The next thing that's coming up actually is a uh, sacred geometry weekend in Nashville, oh. the Athens of the South. You knew that, right, Kyle? That Athens was yes. founded as the Athens of the South? I think. I'm pretty sure you told me that. I think I did. You know, there's the <clears throat> full-scale replica of the Parthenon there. That's right. At least a guy that was yeah. uh, bearded and looked a lot like you told me that. Mm. So, yeah. Well, yeah, there are <laughs> there are some guys, you know, amongst the gods of old that look look like that. <laughs> um, yeah. So it's a it's a sacred geometry weekend. And it's going to be introductory, so it's going to kind of overlap with the course and classes we're going to launch this fall. Um, so we'll be going all day Saturday and half a day Sunday, and we'll be talking about, it's going to be, you know, your standard hands-on, you know, straight edge and compass, learning the basic drawings, and um, it's going to be just get, you know, the live stream is, we're going to do, we're going to live stream it in addition to having uh people actually there in the uh in the hive i think it's called there it's a might be a masonic room building i'm not sure i'll find out i i saw it you know when we first started discussing this a month ago or more ago but uh i don't remember exactly where it is and but, that uh, should be up on the uh home page of randallcarlson.com yeah. right now but it's going to be it'll be a good introduction i mean we, we will get into some of the philosophy and some of the symbology and you know, obviously we, we can't avoid that because this is a course in sacred geometry. So, you know, not Euclidean. Well, it is Euclidean geometry. You see, that's the thing. It's, it's, it's exactly Euclidean geometry. It's all the same proportion. I mean, same proposition, same axioms, et cetera, that you find it's all built on the same thing. The only difference is you have this dimension of, of philosophical meaning and symbology that goes with it. Um, so numbers aren't num just numbers, forms aren't just forms, but they have the meaning. They have, um, they, they're symbols that represent forces and processes and things like that. So that's what differentiates, I guess you could say sacred geometry from normal, normal Euclidean geometry. Although there are people that think you can study sacred geometry without being well grounded in, in the basics of Euclidean geometry. But what I try to do is make that as simple and painless and as interesting as possible, actually. When I had uh, geometry, I think we had it in eighth grade. God, I found it boring. Because I had, it was actually, the guy's name was Mr. Carlson. And I think it's okay to speak about Mr. Carlson now, because I strongly suspect he's long gone on to, you know, better, bigger and better things in, <laughs> in the next world. But, um, oh, Mr. Carlson, he, he. He was bald. He was, you know, pattern baldness and his feet were splayed out. And so he kind of waddled like a duck. Everybody used to call him Chrome Dome. Um, so uh, he, I'm sure he was a 
fairly, you know, I'm sure he was a very decent fellow, a good man all the way around. I have no reason to believe otherwise, but Oh, he just wasn't the most interesting teacher. And I sort of sat towards the back of the class and I had this kid behind me on a desk who was constantly screwing with me, distracting me. He was one of those guys, you know, that he's behind you and he just can't, you know, put things down your shirt, flick your ears, pull on your hair. And, you know, on more than one occasion, I was really tempted to just punch his lights out, but I refrained. And uh, so the whole moral of the story is, is I didn't do so good in eighth grade geometry, but it was very dry. Remember how you remember proofs, right? And proofs actually can be very interesting, but, but, you know, you set it up and you just got to go, oh, well, it's this definition and this proposition and this axiom. And uh, if that's all there is to it, it just didn't seem to me at, uh, you know, when I was 13 or 14 or whatever in eighth grade that, I wasn't seeing a whole lot of relevance to that. Uh, a few years later, of course, I changed my mind when I beheld the, the divine geometry of cre all creation displayed before me. Then I had a different uh, response to it. But um, my point is, is that there's a lot of people sort of, you might want to say in the kind of the new age community that uh, are really, you know, when you start talking about the proofs, they go, oh, Ooh, we just want to get some nice, you know, channeled stuff that, you know, all we have to do is sit back and be, be stroked. We don't actually have to like, try to think to how do I prove this? I mean, how do I prove that, you know, that two parallel lines on the same base and between the two parallel, same two parallel lines are going to have the same area, no matter how skewed they are. I mean, how do you, how do you prove that? How do you prove what the, uh, you know, the, the, the relationship of the golden section, but that's important because geometry was considered in the classical world. This is why, you know, it is rumored said that Plato over the, um, over the entrance to his uh, Academy had the words engraved, let none enter here who are ignorant of geometry. And in fact, I might even just for the hell of it. Yeah, there we go. We've well, already got a list be... of questions. This is going to be a, a beginner course, right from right from the start. So, um, I think right it'll be eight, ten hours of drawing exercises, and you start right yep. at okay. How do you create a perpendicular line? The basics. It's going to be the basics yep. because this fall we're going to launch the new series. It's going to really get into the advanced stuff, but you can't get into the advanced stuff without knowing the basics. And and it's going to be the whole. Uh, presentation is going to be oriented as is the, the, the course coming later for people who want practical applications. You know, if, I mean, if you're an architect, if you're any kind of a designer, a builder, uh, a craftsperson who, you know, anything from building furniture to quilting to, um, you know, uh, stained glass. I mean, you could just start a list, make a list of, of anything that, you know, if you're an artist, um, even writers, for example, because by incorporating some of the proportionalities that are found in sacred geometry, you can actually create almost a more rhythmical presentation of a narrative, a written narrative. Um, obviously, in music, the same thing, because you're all, you know, you're dealing with frequencies and ratios. And it turns out that the numbers that have uh, connections with very auspicious frequencies are also the numbers associated with specific geometric forms. And so you get this relationship between um, between form and number, be between form and tempo, for example. Um, and then it kind of leads into an idea we've talked about multiple times, I think, on this, this show is the, the, the phonetic connections between words and how they can give you clues as to higher meanings or, or hidden dimensions of meaning. Like pointing out, for example, that the word tempo temporal now tempo right how does how do you define the word tempo um it's like the timing pace. yeah the timing it's a constant yeah, it's, uh regular interval of time yeah regular interval of time uh let's see tempo definition we will see here uh yep uh let's see take a look here the the technical definition the speed at which a passage of music is or should be played the rate or speed of motion so it's it's definitely referring to uh, time, 
the rate, the rate of speed. When you're talking about the rate, you're talking about time, right? Um, in this case, specifically, um, a series, uh, yeah, a, of a musical piece or passage indicated by one of a series of directions such as Largo, Presto, or Allegro, and often by an exact metronome marking. Well, we all know, I mean, I certainly, when I was learning percussion, I made my, you know, constant use of my metronome um, to be able to set timing, right? Um, are we seeing this image of the... Yep, got it. Yeah, that, I, I really like it. So you can see here, this is the three, five, and the seven, which of course is significant. This is the, the winding staircase that, re, that leads up. And then beyond this door here, you see there's a light. So you're actually, you're climbing up the three, five, and seven winding stairway to go through this doorway into the light. Uh, you, in order to go up the stairway, you have to pass between the two columns. And on one, you have a celestial, a terrestrial globe with lines of latitude and longitude. And on the other one, you have the celestial globe. With the, uh, the, the zodiacal band, the plane of the ecliptic and the stars depicted upon it. And so this is sort of just a depiction of the, the academy uh, with that particular uh, inscription over the doorway. It's actually, you know, a Masonic image. Um, the two pillars are Yachin and Boaz, etc. We're not going to get into that right now. But um, so, yeah, think about this. Tempo, temporal. What does temporal mean? Well, if you're talking about something that's temporal in nature, what, com what comes up for the definition of temporal? Let's see, T-M-P, T-M-P-O-R-A-L, temporal definition. And we see that uh, it means, this is the, I'm sorry, um, temp when I go fast and I make mistakes. So, so relating, okay, to worldly as opposed to spiritual affairs, secular. And then the second meaning is related, relating to time. Uh, and it gives us an example, the spatial and temporal dimensions of human interference in complex ecosystems. But the idea, so there's two meanings. One is worldly, but also it, it relates to time. So tempo, temporal, um, but then take a look at the, another word that comes from the, from the same root, temple, right? A temple is a manifestation in material of a sacred idea right so when you build a temple you got to think that you're actually the temple represents a almost a freeze frame of a particular temporal sequence <clears throat> that might be um you know measured on a uh on a on a curve where you're going from one zero point to another zero point and as you collapse or expand uh, the the uh the waveform you're changing the tempo right from this to this right and you got to think of the temple itself the idea of the temple itself is it's like a, a taking a waveform and freezing it or embodying it in material so there's this kind of this connection between the idea of a temple and a tempo um, and we could play with a bunch of words like that and uh, I think extract some some deeper meanings, which which is very interesting. Or but, maybe so, it's 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 like a time capsule in a way. Like you're saying it freezes that, but of course all the symbolism and everything else you might put into it sort of freezes that in time as well. Yeah, that's one way you could look at it. So well, we got uh, a list of questions coming up already. People are donating and throwing their questions out there. You well, let's have some questions. All right. Well, first, thanks to Bruce. Bruce Silva and Kyle DeLille, our buddies. Uh, Bruce sent 20 bucks for beer. All right. And uh, Kyle DeLille said, adding to Bruce's beer money donation, except in Canadian leaves. Thanks. <laughs> thanks, Kyle, for the leaves. Uh, and What's up, bro? <laughs> yeah. Okay. This first question from Thomas. Um, says what? Okay, what is the significance of the maple and the hemlock between the mound? That's the first part of the question. No, oh, 
uh, the, the, the mound at which the queen of heaven materialized. Is that I, what he's talking I about? I don't know. That's then, yeah, and, that's what, that's what that reference is. Okay. And then the second part of the question is, is that connected to Fulcanelli's decipherment? Quote, it is written that life takes refuge in a single place, unquote, from the Hindu ah, stone. Ah, interesting question. Yeah. Um, yeah. Hmm. I would say that perhaps, yeah, I think it would not be illegitimate to make that connection. Um, the idea that, you know, in a disaster, there are places of refuge. I mean, we know that from studying ecosystems, when you have a wholesale destruction of habitat, yeah, Bradley and I saw that back when we went and visited uh, Mount St. Helens. The the while we were waiting on Graham Hancock to get into Portland, we were a couple of days or a day early, and so we took a ride up to Mount St. Helens, something I'd been wanting to see for years. And you could really see two things were obvious: one, the the devastation, but two, also how quickly nature was reclaiming that devastation. And in another you know, 30, 40 to 50 years, most of that area is going to be, have become reforested about, I think, what, a half, third of it. I don't think it was up to a half of it. Maybe it was a half of it. A third quarter, something like that of it had been regrowth. Um, there was still a lot of hillsides with uh, the trees oh, yeah. strewn down and laying on the ground there. Yeah. Well, let's say another century, another century. It should probably be mostly reforested. But <clears throat> the point is, is that that recovery takes place from these zones of, of refuge, you know, so it's, it's in, in fact, in, in environmental sciences, uh, it's referred to as a refugium. And typically there will be these islands of, or pockets of survival where there is some genetic diversity, say in plants primarily. And from, from those islands <clears throat> that had survived the, devastation you know life will extend out usually in the form of ferns primarily and there will be you know a few a number of generations overturning of ferns but that fern for example mixing with the ash if it's in the case of a volcanic eruption like mount saint helens can actually produce uh, some fairly fertile soil that then become reseeded with you know the lower the plants that's the lower part of the succession and then it'll eventually work its way back up to a climax but so you've got this idea right there even in the in the environmental sciences of of life taking refuge in a single space so yeah i think we can you know because so much of the way the world works we can understand by analogy so i would say absolutely we could think of that five acres there um you know, on the Door Peninsula as being uh, a place of refuge and, and sort of providing us with a, with a representation of something that could occur on a much larger scale. And I think what we're seeing uh, as we study the Younger Dryas, which was the last great, I'm going to say, series of global catastrophes that caused uh, a considerable uh, destruction of habitat. Now, well, here, think about this. Okay, so you got 6 million square miles minimum of land surface covered in ice. And in a few thousand years, and of course, while that's happening, there's no life under that ice. I mean, microbial life, sure. But you don't have trees and forests and shrubs and animals or any of that. You don't have any of the higher life. That ice rapidly melts away. And now you've got a whole ecosystem that has to recover post ice. So in Canada now, large swaths of Quebec and Ontario and so on until you get to the Western prairies are all forested. But obviously they weren't forested 12,000 years ago. So when it would be very interesting to have like a time-lapse video of how the forests uh, reoccupied the devastated area that had been buried under ice for thousands of years. But yes, I think that... Um, Fulcanelli is referring to life takes refuge in a single space um, in a general sense, but also in a specific sense that in the case of uh, an apocalyptic event, uh, that life could take uh, refuge in a single space from which um, the devastated regions, habitats, areas of the planet could then be repopulated. All right. Well, do you want to yeah, so do you want to explain what is the 
what was he talking about with the maple and the hemlock between the mound? Like, what exactly is that symbolism there? Well, I'm not that up on the symbolism of the the, the two. I mean, um, hemlock. Interestingly, I can tell you this much. Um, hemlock. It was, a, it was a great question from Thomas. So thanks, Thomas. Yeah. Um, the hemlock uh, is known to be some associated with something negative and poisonous. Um, and uh, let's see, hemlock, this is a hemlock symbology, is eternally deadly, or is a proverb to express, you will cause my death. Oh, okay. Uh, also, uh, the announcer of the dead, and were, get this, regarded as forerunners of coming disaster. So that's some of the symbology of a hemlock right there. Ah. Uh, I would say that's apropos here. Yes, it is. Yeah. Now, let's see. The maple tree. Uh, I'd come across this. I did actually look this up like years and years ago when I was first re um, researching this. Okay. So, okay. So by contrast, okay. So you have the hemlock, which is, uh, the, the negative side announcing disaster and all of that. The maple symbolizes a promise, a promise of balance, love, longevity, and abundance. Um, so there. Um, all right. It also is a symbol of strength and endurance. So, but also, you know, we get maple syrup. Yes. What would life be without That's maple syrup? the best syrup? part. That's the best part. I that's agree. the best part, right? <laughs> Pancakes. So that's kind of an interest. Yeah, the, the 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 two trees, the maple and the hemlock, have this very contrasting symbology to it. Right. Hmm. Okay. Brad, is your your chat message there? Is I have to click on it to get the thing to go away. So I hope you didn't say anything disparaging about Randall. Because <laughs> yeah, it's going to show up. <laughs> <laughs> nope. Have at it. <laughs> Nothing. No, he got. I can't look at the chat today. while we're broadcasting yeah, got... the window live. Yeah. I got it out of my system. <laughs> you got it out of the system earlier, yeah. <laughs> All right, next then, question. Then I, then I had a gummy. Oh, okay, yeah. <laughs> next question. Uh, this is from Kyle. It's a different Kyle, right? This is not it's you. not me. I okay. didn't do it. Yeah. Uh, and he says, okay, if you were to postulate how high tech do you think a civilization could have been in the Pleistocene era? And then he says, thanks, guys. This is awesome. Thank well, you, buddy. Although- high tech i think they could have been high tech but their technology may not have looked anything at all like our technology um and that's that's a really involved question to try to answer um i am however going to be addressing that um indirectly and really maybe more so directly when we really take a deep dive into the symbolism of the holy grail because those have been you know, listening to some of the things I've been dropping and saying over the years is that I think the, that the grail itself is a symbol for a type of lost technology. And so, yeah, we're going to, we're going to definitely dive into that. Um, but I think that the, that the, um, the answer to that might be if we take a parallel track of thinking and we look at some of the kind of things that, um, Oh, Nikolai Tesla was doing and Wilhelm Reich and a number of others may provide clues into what an alternate technology might look like. And of course, it wouldn't necessarily have any of the same kind of infrastructure uh, that we have um, in our modern civilization built upon primarily the use of energy extracted from the ground in the form of uh, so-called fossil fuels. But um, if you have a technology that's based upon the earth itself. Uh, so yeah, that's something that we will be exploring. So I don't want to get too much into that right now because, but it's a very good question. I will say this though, in the presentations I did on Atlantis and other, you know, I, I don't really even speculate about that. Why? Because if you listen to what I am saying about when I, you know, did, you know, whatever it was, seven and a half hours of, of Atlantis. You know, we did a whole long extended four or five episodes of Atlantis when we launched, launched the Cosmographia podcast. Um, 
what I'm saying in there is that if we go by Plato's account, you know, we don't really have to invoke images of any kind of advanced technology. Plato, what he describes is a sophisticated, very active maritime culture, as we talked about. So when I get into talking about a possibility of Atlantis, I'm simply basically saying that I think in terms of what we know about the geology uh, of that time, the idea of a potential civilization arising on uh, mid-Atlantic islands is not such a huge stretch. Um, but, you know, if you start, you know, using like a uh, normal guy, Mike, who Mike likes to make reference to um, whatever. Crystal crystal, spaceships. Yeah. Crystal spaceships. Yeah. I mean, unless one of those Greek terms got mistranslated out of Plato's accounts and it really meant crystal spaceships, um, there was nothing in there that I found in any of the four or five translations I've read of those two dialogues that translated as crystal spaceships. But we could create and, and this in a way is you know it's certainly outside the conventional models of prehistory that we would have an advanced maritime civilization that could be building ships and sailing the world and you know we really don't need to go too much beyond the technological levels of say the phoenicians or the minoans you've got to have capabilities of building ships that can sail long distances. And that also means you have to have navigational skills to have those navigational skills implies you probably know something about astronomy. And so we certainly do see the one thing I would get into though, is, you know, when we start looking at um, megalithic structures and the movement of huge stones, to me, I think that the, uh, the, the likely explanation there really, I mean, that really does, I mean, let me put it this way. The idea of them having ancient peoples having some kind of technological means for moving large stones is not any more bizarre than assuming you had, you know, thousands of guys struggling to move a thousand ton stone or more than that. I mean, because one guy, I mean, if you've got a hundred ton stone, 10 guys can't lift a ton, you know, right. so how many people right. do you need to move that? I mean, you know, you, and all over the world, people are moving. 50 and 100 ton stones and bigger much bigger i mean you you guys showed on on your egyptian trip you saw what was the uh the largest um obelisk i think what was the weight of that one? Oh, i mean there were some like 800 tons weren't there yeah some of the standing ones are really heavy but the and then there's the one that's still in the quarry which yeah. they clearly intended yeah. to move and it's been estimated to be maybe 12 12 1200 yeah, yeah. 4, so 000, I mean, yeah. yeah. Look, when you realize, okay, you could go, okay, it's not so far fetched to think that one culture in ancient history had some kind of obsession with moving really heavy stuff around, right? Right, to prove something to themselves or to somebody else or whatever. But when you when you see how universal it is, and people all over the ancient world are, you know, moving these gigantic stones apparently with impunity you got to think that they're using something that we don't know about. Um, that would be my, my thought on that. Now, if you, if you do think about the alternate within the more conventional framework of thinking is that you just have, all, it's all brute force. Um, you know, that you've got these hunter gatherer societies that are being completely organized. You know, I guess in the seasons when the game is, we we're waiting for the game to migrate or something. They're sitting around with nothing to do. So they start quarrying, you know, 100, 200, 300 ton stones and moving them around just for laughs. But, you know, when you, when you look at that idea, to me, that's really almost more absurd than thinking they might've had some technological means of, you know, transporting great weights. Right. You know, like life's so easy that we're sitting around looking for hard things to do. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and I mean, the level of social organization that's implied with these projects is extraordinary. No, no, clearly, clearly, in my opinion, there is a whole lot to learn yet about prehistoric civilizations. Um, so the answer to your the, the quick answer to that is, okay, if we start discussing Atlantis, we don't need to talk about higher technologies, because 
you know, Plato's not saying anything in there. Oh, and by the way, they built temples out of, you know, 200 ton stones. He doesn't say that in the dialogue, but you know, so it's, so what I do is I take a, there, I take a conservative uh, approach and say that, well, you know, what's so implausible about thinking that, I mean, Hey, look, Mediterranean, like Malta was, there's evidence of occupancy of Malta going back 20 to 30,000 years and other islands in the Mediterranean. Now, if you've got, you know, the ability to sail to, from the mainland to Malta or other areas, 20,000, 30,000 years ago, what's, what's such a huge stretch to think you could have sailed from, uh, you know, Iberia West for four five, six days to a group of islands there. That's not, I mean, you don't, that's not such an exotic, bizarre, um, you know, outlier of an idea that it can't be seriously considered. Yeah. But that's that's a different question than it, did they have technological capabilities? And I definitely lean in the direction that, yes, they had technological capabilities that we've lost or forgotten. Simply because having been a builder and having known what's involved with moving just a half a ton or a ton, it just doesn't make sense to me that without some technical assistance, some technological assistance, you know, hunter gatherers or subsistence farmers would be regularly engaged in this practice all over the ancient world. Right. That just, that doesn't make sense to me. Any all right. We got more rolling in all the time. More rolling, questions. rolling, rolling. Keep them questions rolling. I wonder if we should pull this one up, this, the vision. Okay, so Matthew, Matthew uh, Barrio says, is it possible that Nebuchadnezzar II's vision, I think it was a vision or a dream that Daniel interpreted, could yeah. be metaphoric or prophetic of a comet impact destroying the different nations regardless of strength, past, or future? Mm, well, that certainly seems possible to me. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it certainly was apocalyptic in its own way. Yes. Um, Let's see. Should we go out, dive into the details of it? Yeah, a little bit. Okay, so the four successive kingdoms, that sort of, that synchronizes with the idea of four ages that seem to be very prevalent in some of the, yep. some of the ancient models. So you had four successive kingdoms that will be eventually placed, replaced by what? The, the, the kingdom of heaven at the end of it. Um, let's see here. If we look at the... Um, Daniel second, um, in his night dream, the king saw a gigantic statue made of four metals from its head of gold to its feet of mingled iron and clay. As he watched a stone not cut by human hands, destroyed the statue and became a mountain filling the whole world. Hmm. Ooh, now think about yep. this, because what we now know from the studies, uh, the, the microscopic studies of, of younger Dryas impact proxies is that it was multiple, um, uh, was a comp a very complicated composition and it apparently was multiple metals involved. And that was one of the things that the, that the critics seized upon. And they said, because what the critics were trying to do was oversimplify and say, well, if you had an impact, you should be looking for merely one substance. But the fact of the matter is, is that we now know from studies of asteroids that many of them are rubble piles and you can have an accumulation of, of many different compositions. So, you know, there's nothing, you know, hypothetically, you, you could have four metals. Um, but then the idea um, becomes a mountain filling the whole world. Well, think of that as a metaphor for what you would see if, uh, if something is approaching the earth. Yeah. As it's getting larger and larger and filling the whole sky. So, yeah, maybe yeah, so. He's on yeah. something. Sounds like he's on um, something to me. Yeah, the, the, the stone not cut by human hands. Now, could that be an implication? Uh, could that be a reference to something, you know, a way of cutting stones the that Shamir. is not just, yes. you know, that again, is there a possibly hint there of a, of a technological, of a technological means? Yes, it sounds like yeah. tech. Uh huh. All right. Um, oh, but then, and then uh, there was a kingdom <laughs> established by God, which would never be destroyed. So there you get you got the the idea of the place of refuge, or yeah. Interesting. All right, we got some Atlantis questions. You want to tackle some of those? Sure, why not? Okay, above Vegas, uh, or a uh, Bob 
Vegas. Maybe that's what it is. Ten bucks says Atlantis thought experiment. What if they did lose their way and cast away survivors embedded and steered society since leading us to where we are on a mission to a one world order? So I'm not sure. Let's see. What if they did lose their way and cast away survivors? The Atlanteans? Yes. I think that's who they are. They. Okay, well, let's assume they are. That's who he's referring to, the Atlanteans. And I think, you know, there's going to have to be a lot of reading between the lines and a lot of inferences here. But if we're talking about an actual historical uh, civilization that might have once lived on islands, which we know two things for we can almost say with certainty is that Number one, the, the eustatic lowering of sea level means that the area of those islands gets considerably greater. But we also have the isostatic depression of the sea level, which, again, we don't have the definitive proof, but the evidence that is in hand would suggest that there was some pretty major subsidence that went on along the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, and that um, large portions of the Atlantic Ocean Basin, particularly focused along the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, were what were much nearer to the oceanic surface during the ice age because of the isostatic differentiation which i talked about extensively in the atlantis uh, series that we did so i don't think i'm going to try to reiterate that i would just say to understand that better go back and watch the series where we we talk about it and we look at the empirical evidence that we have in hand but if we assume that somewhere between 14 and fifteen thousand years ago there was a you know, an accelerated rise in sea level, and you had a island kingdom that was a maritime culture. So they had port cities and all the extensive accoutrements of of ports and conducting trade and all that. And now you get rapid sea level rise. That's going to be very disruptive to your society. And you're going to have to constantly be making amends. Now, some of the we look at some of the modern countries like the lowland countries like the Netherlands, right? So what do they do? They're exactly large swaths of the Netherlands that's below sea level. So what do they do? They build seawalls, right? To, to with, so it would seem to me that if you had a culture that was um, hypothetically similar to what we're invoking for the Atlantean culture, they would be forced to either adapt by almost in a sense, abandoning their, their seafaring civilization and, and retreat inland, or they would try to hold back the sea by building seawalls. And we know that people do that and it can work. However, when you're talking about sea level rising 400 feet, um, that's going to be pretty challenging, right? So, and then when you start throwing in the, the possibility of violent subsidence, uh, because some of the, the evidence that we talked about s- certainly suggests very significant seismic events, which would have been earthquakes, perhaps nine plus on the Richter scale. Um, I would think that perhaps as long as you have a stable environment and everything's prosperous and you have abundance, it what that does is it would create a disincentive for some of the things that, you know, conflict war, imperialism. But if you have a civilization that's under threat of extinction, um, perhaps that might, you know, create the incentives to want to go out and, um, you know, create this drive for empire to get the resources necessary. Like, for example, think of it this way, you got the rising sea level. and, And one of the things that Plato does say is that the Atlanteans were enslaving you know, the, 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 the people oh, yeah. inside. So what were they enslaving them to do? They were enslaving them. Okay. So are they importing slaves back to Atlantis? Well, what would you do with slaves? I mean, or if, the, and if they did do that, what were they, what was the purpose of enslaving people? Well, perhaps they were having to build seawalls, hmm. which would have taken an enormous amount of, of labor and manpower to do. Of course, all this is just purely speculative, but I don't think it's speculative that's so far off the rails that it couldn't be a real scenario. Um, so if that happens, yeah, maybe they um, went from being a peaceful culture 
carrying on trade, cultural exchange with many other cultures, and then faced with their own demise, they went through a sort of a philosophical shift. Now, as to whether I don't see any direct link between what would have happened 12 or 13 or 11 or 13,000 years ago and what's happening now. And I am also tend to be somewhat skeptical about the new world order, only from this standpoint. I don't think it's as organized as people think it is. I think there are disparate groups that are all jockeying for power. And sometimes they find it to their mutual advantage to cooperate, but other times not to. Um, I, you know, it, you know, you could have to start going through, if you started making the list of all of the people that seem to be the prime movers of all the stuff, let's say that's been going on for the last, I would put it since World War II. I would say World War II. So it's post-World War II, you had this consolidation of power that took place primarily in Western cultures. Um, and it's basically grown since then. And it basically is centered primarily on the consortium of American intelligence agencies. Um, and there's a lot of stuff being manipulated from there. But, you know, uh, it just, we get into this area where it's so easy to just kind of stray off into, um, you know, the, the waters of the irrational when you're talking about this. We got to be careful, um, you know, and, you know, somebody, you know, you guys brought up and mentioned the, the Georgia Guidestones. To me, there's a perfect example of taking, taking something, one little, one thing and just running with it until it, it's gotten so completely blown out of the original reality. You know, in 1980, and I'll digress on that for a minute, because just in case somebody's going to ask about yeah, it. Yeah, people anyway. have, people have mentioned it already in the chat. So I'm sure. Okay. So what you said. look, late seventies, you see a revival of the cold war, right? Um, you know, Vietnam was over, you know, the, 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 the stalemate of the cold war, you know, we're still going toe to toe. We've got, you know, thousands of nuclear missiles aimed at each other. We're still operating under the mutual assured destruction, um, idea of, of, of nuclear war, mutual assured destruction. Of course, that is, you know, the acronym is mad. Um, and that summed it up. And so Carter came to office in 76 and people thought that there was this, you know, a chance for a rapprochement, I guess, with the Soviet Union, and maybe we could, you know, dial down the um, the tensions, the Cold War tensions that were so prevalent. Well, that lasted for about two years, and then, um, you know, the whole Carter Doctrine, the invasion of of Afghanistan by the Soviets, because that was you got to bear in mind that that was now that was in a, a U.S. intelligence operation was to gather all of the most radical and extremist Muslims you could from all over the, the world, right, into one place, into Afghanistan, start training them there. And, um, you know, people don't know the background to why the Soviets invaded Afghanistan. But in any case, they did invade Afghanistan. And then the U.S. decides we're going to boycott the Olympics because the Olympics was held in, in going to be held in Russia. And then Reagan comes into office, wins, and, you know, a big part of that summer of 1980 is is this uh, this intensified Cold War rhetoric. A lot of people were starting to get really fearful about nuclear war. Now, on the other hand, <clears throat> you also see some major things happening on on some other fronts. During the 70s, there was a slew of books that kind of followed in the wake of of Emanuel Velikovsky and were invoking these scenarios of naturally induced planetary disasters, apocalyptic scenarios that, you know, it was, of course, in 1980 that the first three uh, uh, independently um, published um, articles came out, papers came out, each one with evidence that the Cretaceous tertiary ended with a cosmic impact and caused planetary devastation, right? But that was preceded by a number of things. One was you know, I've talked about a couple of the books that I first read on Atlantis, um, the Otto Mook book, um, The Secret of Atlantis, the um, the Quest for Atlantis by Cedric Leonard. You know, now in, in both of those, they invoke natural disasters on a planetary scale. And they maybe had some of the specifics wrong, but in the larger framework, they were right because they were they were seeing what has been now demonstrated by mainstream science that, yes, 
at the time that we would speculate that Atlantis existed at the end of the last ice age, there were a series of major disasters that occurred. So if you go back now, my, my studies of catastrophism go back to, uh, I would say 73 to 75. And I think I probably first read Velikovsky somewhere in that window, right in there. And that was followed by, you know, Charles Hapgood and a number of others that were all invoking planetary catastrophes on one form or another. Okay. So you had this awareness uh, in a lot of people's mind who are, who are studying into um, mythology and those traditions and so on, that there was this, you know, the prophecies or prophecies about catastrophes well known way back in the early seventies was the, the Hopi prophecies, right. And um, the blue star and <clears throat> all of these things that were invoked by some people as perhaps being a comet that could. Uh, so that idea it was not accepted by mainstream science by any means, but it was definitely out there. It was in the zeitgeist, right? So when you had that and you had the possibility of nuclear war, there was a very much, there was a period of, of very much apocalyptic mindset. Now, if you look at the, um, the, the um, symbolism of the guidestones, I mean, clearly, and oh, let me, that, Chris, if you, you know, one of the prominent voices of catastrophism in the 70s was Hapgood. And you guys are familiar with Hapgood's scenario, right? Yeah. Yes. That accelerated plate tectonics, um, sort of a pole shift, unlike, unlike Velikovsky, which was speculating that the entire planet shifted its orientation, right? Axial shifted the entire planet. Velikovsky's was a little, little closer to what we actually now admit. That, that, that the plate tectonic, the tectonic plates move relative to the mantle. It's all a matter of rates though. Or is it, you know, always so imperceptibly slow that we, we, we are unaware of it. Or are there times when there are accelerated plate tectonics? I have speculated that the answer is yes, there is times when there's accelerated movement of the plates and it has exactly to do with, um, glacial and you know the the inception of a glacial age and the end of a glacial age so um so i guess here's the point i'm getting at um hapgood's theories may have not been so far off the mark right okay okay so if we accept his ideas the you know his, one of his ideas which still you know, explain something that hasn't been explained. And this may not be the explanation for it, but why was the Laurentide ice sheet centered over Hudson Bay and the Arctic Ocean was basically ice free and Siberia was northern Siberia within the Arctic Circle was largely ice free. Well, Hapgood's explanation was, is that if you shift the, the crust of the earth by roughly 30 degrees, you could move Hudson Bay up and it would be centered over the North Pole. And what's interesting about that picture is that if you, if you draw a circle, around uh you know around the pole roughly down to say uh 70 degrees 60 degrees let's say 60 degrees so you've encompassed 30 degrees let's say um 23 and a half right well that's going to be the arctic circle and if you place the pole the north pole at hudson bay and you draw a circle around what would have then been the arctic circle that pretty much defines the ice complex of the, the late place, the Wisconsin ice age, right? What's the explanation for it? I don't know. I'm not saying that Hapgood is right, but here, 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 here's what, again, what I'm getting at. The late seventies was ripe with a revival of apocalyptic scenarios. When that came out, you know, the, the people that I was aware of and talked to, because, you know, I became a, a member of the brotherhood in 78. So I had access to a lot of these thinking that would have been connected because, you know, um, Wyatt C. Martin, um, the landowner that do donated the land, um, Fendley, who owned Pyramid Quarries, they were all brothers of the fraternity. And I think, you know, uh, uh, an acquaintance of mine, Brian James, is, I, I think has, who, who's been studying this um, for a long, long time, um, I think there is evidence now of who R.C. Christian actually was. And he was apparently a conservationist. And he was an apocalyptic. He believed that there was going to be an apocalypse that was going to wipe out large portions of the Earth's population. If you look at that most controversial line on those um, on those guidelines, it says 
maintain population at 500, not reduce the population to 500 million, maintain it at 500 million. Right. We're seeing all kinds of evidence now that, that there have been bottlenecks in the human population going back 70, 80,000 years. And it looks like there is some amazing, and, and it's something we've got to circle back to because a lot of new stuff is coming out and that we haven't covered in depth, suggesting major bottleneck of the human population at the Younger Dryas. In fact, it may not be widely speculative to say that the human population planet-wide may have been reduced to a few hundred thousand people, right? So in a case like that, you're, we're well below that 500 million mark. So now, um, from what I recall, Archie Christian's actual name was Herbert something. Um, he was a conservationist who did believe that population, uh, the population explosion was a big problem. But he was also a, like I said, he, he was an ap apocalyptic. And if you look at what, um, in fact, I wrote something. I think I have it right here. Let's see. I do believe. Let me yeah. inject something there while you're looking yeah, for it, Randall, because yeah. you brought it up earlier. You know, um, amongst all those tensions and uh, building knowledge and everything that you're listing around the late 70s going into 1980, and then May of 1980, Mount St. Helens yeah. blew up. Yeah. And, and, and see, that was taken at the time. A lot of people looked at that and said, well, yeah, this is the beginning yep. of it. You um, it. Well, can so we, here, can we, can you wrap it up pretty quick? Cause we have some yeah, serious I donations, but, but I figure it's, it's good to, to, to get this, lay this to rest. Now this right. Brian James, whom I knew through the Theos Theosophical Society posted this. He says, um, I have read, uh, and studied every aspect of this monument. He's talking to somebody who's like invoking the, the new world order kind of thing. You assume that it's meant for us in quotes now, but, and, and I agree with what he's saying here, but it was meant for a post-apocalyptic world, a fear that was widespread in 1980. And in the midst of the cold war, this was a time where the fear, of what Russia would do was in the air, uh, no killing necessary as this would be rules meant for after a cataclysmic event. There is no racism as he called for diversity and recognized all nations in their languages or no eugenics or need to killing as eugenics does not call for diversity in reproduction, which he does call for. Um, and the population of 500 million was based on numbers to maintain a beginning society that has to start over. Um, so Herbert Kirsten was, was according to his research as Herbert Kirsten was RC Christian. Uh, he was a Rosicrucian, and that's why the monuments yeah. had so many yes. uh, Rosicrucian symbolism in it. Um, let's see. He says the only reason it became public land, which it did in 2005, is because Herbert died that year. The family that owned the land were esotericists. Um, anyways, uh, he says it's not satanic, Luciferian, reptilian, space alien, secret ma Masonic plot to reduce the existing population. None of that. Don't talk about what you don't know. Um, and then I responded and I said that this post from Brian James is the best and most rational explanation for the meaning and purpose of this monument and completely accords with my own researches and studies into this matter. It was absolutely intended as a time capsule and a monument to a post-apocalyptic world with guidelines for the restoration of civilization. It was yes. not a clandestine instruction to some secretive cabal with a genocidal pop depopulation agenda. That is internet nonsense gone off the rails. The only addendum I would add to what Brian had to say is that RC was also likely considering a natural catastrophe as well as nuclear war which in some relatively plausible scenarios of the time invoked polar shift. A sight line, which there was, uh, to the North Star Polaris could conceivably allow one to calculate the amount of axial or crustal displacement in the aftermath of a pole shift. Yeah. The fact that solstice and equinoctial lines as well as lunar cycles were incorporated into the, into the design would facilitate reorientation to the cosmos in a world needing a geodetic and calendrical reset. The fact of eight languages conveying the same message could serve as a sort of Rosetta Stone for future linguists to recover languages that might otherwise have become lost. I think it was also intended to be provocative and inspire discussion. But in the world of 2022, open dialogue of controversial ideas is no longer acceptable. 
The destruction of the Georgia Guidestones was a wanton act of vandalism by ignorant fanatics, and I hope the perpetrators are caught and brought to justice. So there's my statement on the matter. Heck yeah. Man, I appreciate that. Yeah. yeah. It was... Uh... I was bummed to see that thing get destroyed, honestly, because I, yeah. I thought it was cool. Yep. Mm. Um, I never took it that way either, like the, the New World Order type of thing. But right. um, I thought all no, the, the alignments other... were awesome. I was like, this is great. <laughs> we need to build more stuff like this. Yeah, and, and the discussion you guys that we had earlier where I was talking about, you know, that was a very big part of it, too, was the fact the declining, um, you know, granite industry of Alberton County and why the, the, the Masonic group there in town, which included the banker, included the landowner, included the pyramid, um, uh, Fandley, Joe Fandley, right. You already, I mean, his, his quarries were called pyramid quarries. So you can actually uh-huh. see that, you know, yeah. As I see the pyramid right over Russ's left shoulder there, but so they were, they were, yeah. Oh, we're totally on board. This would be really the coolest thing if we do this, you know? And so they brought together some of the highest quality granite that they had in the county. They brought together stone carvers. They brought together linguists, engravers, engineers, astronomers, and they all came together around this project. And now some stupid fucker goes out there and blows the thing up because he's motivated by his own ignorance and fanaticism. That's my opinion on the matter. Yes. And, you know, yeah. Rather than saying, what's this, what did the, the guy who designed this actually mean by this one particular line? Well, I think we've covered that, you know, and there's no, nobody, I would challenge anyone to try to come up with some kind of definitive line between those guys from 40 years ago who, who built that thing and some new world order cabal right now that what that's, you know, imposing the COVID on us and supply chain disruptions and all the rest of that stuff. See, that's fantasy. And what that is, that's psyops. Which, because what happens is there's real conspiracies out there, right? And what's the best way to keep people from perceiving and becoming aware of the real conspiracies is you just get as much mud in the water as you can with stupid conspiracies to get people believing stuff. Because now what happens is the real conspiracies get lost in the noise of the make believe conspiracies that are being fed to the ignorant masses who don't know how to think rationally. And in fact, you know, one of the, one of the, um, guidelines there on there was, you know, let reason, you know, be a, be a guide to the interaction of people reason, you know, is that the kind of thing that the new world order cabal would be promoting the exercise of individual reason, Hmm. you know, uh, I just don't have time for these people that want to shut down any kind of dissenting point of view or something that they don't agree with or don't understand. And clearly this was the act of somebody who didn't understand. And I think, you know, I mean, we can, we can spin conspiracy theories about, you know, cleaning up the crime scene, but I really do think that, you know, some of those guys, county people probably looked at it and said, yeah, this thing could topple over. And if we that's, have people going out there too, to yeah. look at it, we got to get that thing down or, or somebody's going to be liable here. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. I know there were questions about how quickly it was taken down, but it just seemed to me like it, they probably were worried that it was structurally unstable. Well, there's well, yeah. that huge stone on the top. Yeah. 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 So, so you, they took out yeah. one of the legs. Yeah. So, I mean, if you got, you know, county officials thinking, yeah, hey, we might get our asses sued off, you know, yeah, they're going to get motivated to try to do. And so, what's the quickest thing I, they I, could do? You know, who, uh, this is not just some. I mean, somebody had some pretty good knowledge of explosives to pull that off, too. Yeah. Those are big stones. Yeah. Yeah. So That's right. Anyway, well, I don't know. But anyways, yeah. it, it was a shame. It was pointless exercise, you know, prov- provocative idea put out there. So what do you got to do? You got to blow it up. Rather than going, what, who, you know, what's the real story here? You just buy into whatever, you know, whatever gibberish you're reading on the internet. And then, yeah. which re- brings me to something else that I won't get into now. All right. Well, we got more you mean, questions. You mean people on the internet might lie to us, Randall? <laughs> Is that what you're saying right now? You know, there was a time, guys, when, you know, if you wanted to express your opinion on something, you, you know, you, you. You basically how you did it, well, you could go on radio interviews 
but typically your interviewer would make you look like an idiot if you came on there and didn't know what you were talking about, or you wrote letters to the editor. And if an editor of a newspaper magazine or periodical saw your letter and thought, okay, this is sensible. I mean, these guys have thought something through, they bring some knowledge, but if it's just some opinion, obvious opinion with no uh, basis in fact or learning or anything behind it, you know, it's going to get thrown out. Right. If you wanted to have an opinion that was taken seriously, you had to like go to the library and like look things up in books and study something. And then you could, you could write a letter, you could send it in and there would be a vetting process. Well, now what you've got, it's a free for all and every goddamn fool can say anything they want about anything that they don't know about or don't study. And it just, this garbage proliferates. It's, it's like dragging the whole discussion, the whole conversation down to the to the lowest level now that's not to say that there aren't tons of good stuff on the internet but 40 50 years ago there were tons of good stuff in libraries but these but these intellectual lazy fools didn't actually bother to go to libraries so they didn't have a venue to express all their nonsense now we've got that so Anyways, and, and if I see, your nonsense fits the narrative, then the algorithms pick it up and it gets spread around even more. Even more. That's right. That's right. All right. Well, we got a bunch. <laughs> we got a bunch of got questions a bunch of stuff to get through. Let, let me. Let's keep going. Let's first. Let's thank Peter Shell. Donated one hundred forty-four dollars. Says, "See you all in September." Hell yeah, buddy. Yeah. Thanks, yeah. Pete. One of my favorite numbers. I was talking about that number today. One hundred and forty-four. It is a good number because we're going to be. We've decided that we're going to sell the live stream. To the sacred geometry workshop for 72 bucks ah mike was putting it 99 and i said i think we want i want to just make it as affordable as possible so we can get people particularly young people if they're struggling and you know just give them a break i want people to get on board and understand this tool this powerful tool we've got here um excellent so we yeah we're going that's from the beginning bucks. yeah good so twice 72 of course is 144 we got enough of these questions racing in here. You're going to have to do some uh, crank up the Randall uh, responds there with Russ and, uh, yeah, you know, yeah. get, to, get to some more of these in a separate episode. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. I don't, so I'm not really sure what Patty, Patty, $33 says, Randall, do you have an opinion on the Atlantis ring? And then the Atlantis she, ring, the Atlantis ring. And then she says, maybe Russ and Kyle can elaborate a little. I'm not sure what um, we're supposed to say which it's ring? Not, yeah, it's not recot. It's a. It's actually a a little band. But yeah, I don't know anything about it. Oh, there's no. A, I, oh, talking about what um, Johanna has. Is that what she's talking about? I don't know. Oh, the that I don't think yeah, so. I have no idea. Not sure. Um, no. Clue. Is it another place? Like, yeah. Well, we failed to do that. Sorry. Patty. Yeah. Put everything in Clarify, your question. Patty. Don't ask us to ask it. <laughs> Uh, Jason, Jason Moskowitz says for beer and victory, $99, a hundred bucks. Any insight on Justinian's Hagia Sophia mosque? Is that how you say that? I believe so. Yeah. Um, it says completed in 537, right before the dark ages began. What relationship, if any, was there between Justinian and King Arthur? Hmm. Damn. Now that's a really interesting question. Um, yeah, sixth century. So I'm looking here. The dates for its construction was 532 to 537, which is right in that period when the planet was shifting, made its most dramatic shift out of the Roman warm period into the dark ages cold period. And yeah, so the timing is precisely uh, with, you know, the, the battle of Camlan, the death of Arthur, um, you know, 536 AD is considered by some climatologists to have been the coldest year of the last 2000 years. Um, yeah. Wow. So of course, you know, the black, the plague that followed in the aftermath of that is named for Justinian. Um, right. It, it was um, the Hagia Sophia was the largest cathedral in the world for nearly a thousand years. Wow. Until the completion of the Seville cathedral, Seville cathedral. Um, I think we better uh, take a road trip. 
Yes. Check this out. Um, yeah, I've been, I have been really uh, intrigued by that. Um, so let's see uh, if I can find out what the Hagia Sophia. Well, Sophia, of course, you know, is the word for wisdom. Um, yeah, ch oh, church of, there we go, church of the holy wisdom. Uh, yeah, the world's, it was, yeah, the world's largest interior space. Um, so the general question though, is like, could there have been a connection between Justinian and King Arthur, right? What, is there a relationship? Yeah, I, I don't know of any historical relationship. Okay. Um, but listen, I mean, temporally speaking, yeah, they're right exactly in the same window. Right. Um, so that's very possible. Um, and I haven't looked into that, but I think it would be worth looking into further. Um, but yeah, I'm making a note right here. I'm going to do a little research because I... Ah, research question. Uh -huh. Yes. Okay, well, I got another that, question. Who was from, that from? That one was from Jason Moskowitz. Thanks for the support, Thank man. I've yes. seen you multiple times. Yeah, Appreciate Jason, it so much. that's a great question, Thanks, man. Jason. I'm going to look into this. Who knows what we'll find, if anything. But yeah, I mean... And sorry if your question came out rambling. I'm trying not to make them sound rambling. Mm -hmm. I saw that comment, buddy. I saw it. I saw it in there. <laughs> uh, okay, Kyle DeLille says, uh, do you think Velikovsky could be onto something regarding worlds in collision with Mars and Venus? We do have stories in the Iroquois <clears throat> mythology that kind of back up this hypothesis. Yeah, the thing... Yeah, I have trouble with that. Um, you know, my you know, I'm not an astrophysicist, but m my thought is that his, a in most of the attacks against Velikovsky's ideas was not so much in his catastrophism as it was in his astrophysics. And I think the mathematics pretty much negates the possibility of Mars and Venus being randomly ejected from Jupiter and, and ultimately within such a so short period of time of l literally millennia, occupying stable orbits, circular orbits like they now have. Um, most likely anything ejected, say from, from a, like Jupiter would end up disintegrating or be completely lost. I mean, you know, um, rather than going into a, uh, you, to, to, yeah. So to get from like a hyperbolic orbit, when you have a, a long period comet, what differentiates long period comets from the short period comets is, is the um, uh, the conic section of its shape of its of its orbit? So, a short period comet has an elliptical or closed orbit, right? A long period comet typically does not. It's you know the the threshold between an ellipse and a hyperbola is the parabola. So if if an object is seen on a parabolic orbit, you, it, it, in fact, if you're looking at only a short segment of a hyperbolic orbit, it might be indistinguishable from parabolic, right? But a par parabolic is once you've gone from a closed orbit into an open orbit. So typically what's going to happen, and this is really one of the, 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 really the mysteries of the architecture of our solar system is, is, is the, the mostly regular orbits of the planets, right? Um, but even there, we see some really weird stuff going on. You know, Uranus is its axis is tilted at 90 degrees to its orbital plane. That's bizarre. Venus is rotating backwards. How do you explain that without the entire planet flipping over on its yeah, it's upside down. Like it's upside down, right? Um, but still to get it into a stable orbit, that's a major transition right there. And so if you using even a smaller object, which is not going to be subject to nearly the same kind of inertial forces as something on the size of a planet, just to get a comet into a regular orbit is almost impossible. You know, if it's on a hyperbolic orbit, what that means is it's going to come in. If it comes into the inner solar system, it'll get deflected around the sun, but it'll just head back out never to return. It has to be on an elliptical orbit in order to return. So you have to have some means of closing that hyperbola into an ellipse. 
Now, how that would happen on a, a mass, the, of the scale of a planet, I think you'd be hard pressed to find one astrophysicist that could say that that's even remotely possible like that. And I, I tend to, you know, I tend to fall in that direction. I mean, I think there were two parts to Velikovsky's work. One is catastrophism. Um, earth and upheaval is basically the documentation of all of this evidence, which was quite overwhelming, even in the fifties that the planet had been subject to these major interruptions of gradualism. And the second part of his work was, was then theorizing what could have caused this catastrophe. And I, I remember reading one commentator, I don't remember who it was, saying that, well, you know, in the 50s, they didn't understand, you know, he, he was seeing evidence that suggested such severe widespread catastrophes that he began to imagine something really, really huge. What he didn't understand, at least according to one or several of the critics that I have read, was that just a comet, if you're talking about a comet, you know, 10 miles in diameter, you know, hitting the earth, you've got a global catastrophe. And what happens if a comet 50 to 100 miles in diameter, such as the putative uh, Taurid stream uh, progenitor, if that comes in and breaks into, you know, 50 comets, you know, a kilometer wide, 10 kilometers wide, and then you have a succession of multiple impacts over several millennia. What he was not taking into account was how, you know, awesomely catastrophic an event like that could be. And so I don't think we need to go to Venus and Mars being shot out of Jupiter and careening next to the earth. Um, you know, and, and, and I think he was out of his league there where he really, though, you know, got in his stride was the documentation yes. of geological, paleontological and archaeological evidence for catastrophes in earth history. Um, and then linking that with mythology, but you got to be careful with mythology because mythology is pretty elastic and you can, you know, it, sometimes you look at some of these scenarios and they could have multiple plausible interpretations. But I think the things that I've seen are more consistent and inadequately describe Earth's encounter with bolides and comets. Or, well, or maybe still, very large volcanic eruptions. I'm still wondering how you get a rocky planet ejected out of a gas giant. It would, see, there we go. It's a good I mean, question, Brad. There, yeah, it, exactly. was, it had a rocky core, Brad, it's but it's core. gone now. Yeah. And that's why it's just gas. It's the core. <laughs> that's what i'm wondering yeah I'm, I'm i'm ignorant of my velikovsky it's been two decades plus since i read that so i don't remember exactly but yeah that's always my it first is question. interesting that jupiter's core is much smaller than saturn's that's a fun fact that it should have uh, you know te technically speaking with you know it with, was predicted to be, it was predicted to be much larger yeah. because it jupiter's much larger but its core is actually much smaller so anyway mm -hmm. uh thought on fire 13 bucks, thank you very much. Says the moon is 2,160 miles in diameter. Where have I heard that number before? Happy full buck moon. Where have I heard that number before? How many yeah, places? It sounds really familiar. Oh. Yeah, it shows up. It's the price of the Scablands trip. <laughs> <laughs> ah, there we, we should, go. That's, that's what, what it is. was. <laughs> there. <laughs> yeah, two trips to the Scablands in September. Let's go. Oh, man. I'm looking forward to that. Well, 2000. There's some spaces left. Yeah, there are some spaces left. Um, back to the number. I don't know if he means that kind of facetiously. Yeah, I think tongue it's in a, cheek. Or, yeah, yes, yeah. tongue in cheek. Or, or he really is wondering where else. <laughs> no, I think it's tongue in cheek. Well, the, the, the two places that I really, you know, find that number quite germane is the, the average length of an astronomical or ast astrological age, right? If the, and of course, this is probably rounded off and we don't know exactly, but, you know, based upon this rate of slightly above 50 uh, arc seconds per year for the processional motion, what this would suggest is that the, the period of uh, procession, full processional period is just a little bit less than 26,000 years. So a lot of the, even astronomical texts will sometimes give the, the 
length of the processional cycle at 26,000 years. So it's not at all uh, a stretch to say that it could have been very, very close to 25,920. And in fact, it was probably closer to 25,920 than it was to 26,000, right? Was it exactly 25,920? Who knows? I don't know. Maybe you could get Aristarchus on the phone and see if he knows anything or, or Hyparchus. But, um, but, you know, here's the thing. If you divide that by 12, if you look at that as the great year and you divide it by 12, you got 2,160 years for an astronomical age. And each of those 12 astronomical ages was originally named for the constellation that was prominent within that 30 degree band of the, of the uh, plane of the ecliptic. So you've got that, the 2,160 years of an of a astrological month. And then three times that, of course, is 6,480, and, and, and half of a cycle would be 12,960, which is very interesting because I you know, gave some lectures way back in the early to mid-90s talking about a half processional cycle and the evidence that was accumulating even by the 90s for a major disaster at a half processional cycle ago, which, you know, it, it, again, 12,960, give or take a century or two. And now it turns out that the lower, younger, driest boundary is almost 12,900 years. Um, and so that confirmed what a lot of us catastrophists were thinking, you know, 30 years ago, that that, you know, Cedric Leonard's uh, book that I mentioned earlier, The Quest for Atlantis, his, uh, he had a chapter in there, the, uh, the catastrophe of Oh, the catastrophe of 10,000 BC. So he was honing in. He was already at 12,000 years ago. There was a catastrophe. Well, specifically, was there something that could be dated right at 12? Not necessarily. But of course, that puts it right, right smack in the middle of the Younger Dryas, doesn't it? If the Younger Dryas lasted from 12,900 roughly to 11,600, to say 12,000 years ago is, yeah, it's right in the Younger Dryas. So these were catastrophic times. The other, of course, you know, you have a geometric correlation because, you know, each of the five regular polyhedra or platonic solids um, can be uh, described by a unique number, which is the total number of degrees comprising the, um, all of the angles, the edge angles. And so the cube, if you think of a cube, it has six sides, right? And each side is a square. So there are four corners of each square, 90 degrees each. So you get 360 degrees per face of the cube. And since there are six faces, you get a total of 2,160 degrees. The holy city. Defining the cube. Yes, which is now, right, exactly, Kyle, the holy city, which is described as a cube. So there's, there's that. There's more. There's certainly more. Um, and at some point, yeah, we will dive deep into sacred metrology. Yes. And when we do that. Now, in the... Well, we got more more questions, too. Quickly, I will say that in the more intermediate and advanced workshops, we really get into the symbology of the numbers, the canon of sacred numerology, and how they relate to these geometric figures that we've been studying. Um, so anyhow, uh, yeah. What, what's the next question? Okay. So this is another one from Kyle. He says, in an ideal scenario, what should we as humans be focusing on? Technolo technology methods. Oh, drop the phone. Drop the rookie phone. move. Yeah, drop the, uh, to gather information on the past, given impacts have erased a lot. Mm -hmm. Well, first and foremost, I would say, yeah, we need to, in so parallel, you... we need to do two things. I think, um, I think we need to be looking at alternative technologies. Um, and I think there's tantalizing evidence out there that, yeah, there could be a whole nother way of designing a civilization. And again, you know, there are sources of things that I think are pointing to that. I have suggested that I, you know, repeatedly in various venues that I think that the grail is actually a symbol for a technological, um, solution to some of these problems that confront us, but immediately what I think is that, you know, the, um, most immediate need is that we become a, uh, a transplanetary civilization. And I think as long as we're confined to the surface of a planet, we're vulnerable. 
I think that's one of the key takeaways of this. And if we want to ensure our survival as a civilization, we, we must become transplanetary, which means to me, starting with by colonizing the moon and, you know, who was it that said that, um, uh, you know, if God had not intended for us to become a cosmic species, he wouldn't have given us the moon. Um, because yeah, I mean, it's right there. I mean, it's, it's like ready made to create a cosmic port city to the exploration of the solar system. And uh, I know that there's this kind of nihilistic attitude prevalent now um, that just looks at human beings as a complete pariah in nature. And, you know, like I've seen, uh, you know, environmentalist bumper sticker that say it's this things like final diagnosis, the planet has cancer. And of course, the implication being that we, we are, are the, the cancer. cancer. Yeah. Um, you know, be not a cancer on the earth right there. That was um, certainly that's good advice. But um, I don't take that point of view. I don't take that point of view at all. Because if we look at, you know, 600 million years, uh, the history of 600 million years of life on earth, what we see is repeated interruptions repeated setbacks we see life trying to proliferate and then there's a cosmic catastrophe and there's a whole reset and i think we could by analogy see the same thing happening over the last ten thousand years with the history of civilizations which is another thing we're going to dive into and look at because what we see is the last five thousand six thousand seven thousand years there have been repeated catastrophes that have caused major cultural resets um and some of the kinds of things that have, have caused the collapse of earlier civilizations, even within historic times, some of those happening again today could cause severe disruptions um, in the stability of, of our modern you know, 21st century civilization that we have here. Um, so again, one of the things is diversify. You know, if, you, if you're in business and you want to survive all kinds of economic day, uh, downturns and vagaries and stuff. What's the advice? Diversify. And I think as a species, as a civilization, we need to diversify. And I, to me, that starts by, you know, realizing that right outside, 5,000 miles outside of the surface of the earth, we're out into free space and their energy and material resources become infinite. And, you know, to say, to think that that's just science fiction, uh, to take that assumption that that um, uh, you know that is is to me akin to people in the early '60s who are you know belittling the space program, saying it's there are people in the '50s and early '60s who are saying, "Well, we're just wasting our money on going to space. We got too many problems here on Earth. We shouldn't be building rockets and satellites and sending them up." But look, we're sitting here right now. If we if the, if we had not done that in the fifties and sixties, we wouldn't be having this podcast right now, would we? No, we wouldn't. Yeah. So, you know, I'm a futurist in the sense that I believe, um, you know, I believe in the, uh, the human species and what we can ultimately do. And I think we are nature's efforts to evolve a species that can break this cycle of catastrophes that has afflicted life on this planet since it began. And if we don't do that, we will become extinct and nature will evolve another species to attempt the same thing. So I say, let's go for it. And, you know, I've heard people say, you know, way back in the, in the seventies, in the mid seventies, when I was realizing, you know, the work of Gerard O'Neill and others who were, who, who, who had come to understand that, you know, that really we had the potential to become a cosmic civilization. And this is before, you know, the, the, the catastrophist revival of the eighties. Right. And people would say, well, no, we can't, we shouldn't be going to space because, um, and spending our money and resources and time on going to space. Cause we have too many problems here on earth. Okay. Well, let's see 45 years ago, people were saying that, and we, those problems are, have just gotten worse. Right. And it's not because we've had a space program. It's not because we put, you know, the Hubble telescope up there or now the web telescope, it's not because we've sent missions to, to the moon, to the asteroids, to Mars, to Venus, to the sun. It's not because of that. And in fact, what those things are doing is showing us 
that we have this future of unlimited potential. And everything that we're doing to this planet, you know, the mining and the extraction of, of, of raw materials, of ores, precious metals, hydrocarbons, all of that exists in infinite abundance out there. So here's, here's, what, here's the two options. I mean, so do we can go ahead and we can, you know, look, this whole conflict right now with Russia, what, if you take that right down to what its basis is, what is it? It's ultimately about who's going to control the resources of this planet. That's, that's what it, all the other stuff is just trappings. What it's really about is who's going to control the resources of the planet. And that idea is based upon zero sum thinking is that there's a finite amount of resources on this planet and whoever can control those resources is going to prosper and everyone else is going to have to suffer the consequences. So we're going to control those. Russia is our primary competitor, China. So this whole Ukrainian intervention is very much about trying to get Russia to, uh, you know, shoot its wad basically and leave it impotent where it can't, uh, can't be, uh, a competitor to us and that we would have absolute domination of the global marketplace. Right. And that's all based upon this idea that, you, you know, zero sum thinking that, you know, here, here we have this planet with limited finite resources and, you know, we're going to be struggling over finite resources or we can cooperate because the, exploration and economic development of space is such a gigantic enterprise. But all those it, objects out in space are flat. They're flat. <laughs> no, we'll have to have, we'll have to have another discussion about that. <laughs> I'm sorry to interrupt you, but we are coming up on time and, and uh, okay. there are a few more. <laughs> there's, a lot, there's a lot more questions. We're not going to be able to get to them. All. We can't okay, get well, to them all folks. It's yeah. Well, I feel, I feel like a jerk interrupting you, Randall, but you know, that's okay. Gotta... I hope that, I hope that some of the answers might address more than just one question. Well, yeah. And you, yeah, you actually, sure. they were making bets at the beginning of the show that you would only answer three questions. So you've already, <laughs> you've already blown past some there. people's. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> okay. Took the over. <laughs> All right. Let's one more here. So this is maybe an astrological term that I don't know. Chronocator. Uh, Chronocrater, chrono crater. Chronocrater? Chronocrater, yes. So it says, what do you think about the great chronocraters, Jupiter and Saturn? These titans began their conjunction in Aquarius on 12 20 What role do they play in the great year? Is there a cataclysm connection? This is from Dane Christensen. Uh-huh. Well, um, gosh, I think what we need to do there I want to, I want to file that question away because if we look at the Jovian year, the Saturnian year, we find with a little bit of tweaking, a little bit of tweaking, they will fall right. They will mesh right into the, into the cosmic synchronicities. Um, I mean, are we going to take a break or are we almost at the end? We're I, at the end here. Yeah. Oh, we're at the no end. No breaks during the quick. live, man. We don't get breaks during nope. the live. We could just get up and walk out of the screen and just, <laughs> just leave. <laughs> come back in five minutes. <laughs> yeah. Leave you know, the stream going. Not to digress, but yeah, back in about half. 1970, do you remember the band um, Iggy and the Stooges? Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> I just almost Where are the said old yes. timers? heard of them. Don't know any songs. <laughs> According to some people, they were the first punk rock band. And okay. he was a totally wild character and they were a completely wild band that came out and blew all of the peace and love hippie stuff of the late sixties, <laughs> completely out of the water. <laughs> but I saw them in concert twice and what they would do is they would like just be jamming and they would just get in this heavy, intense music with all of this feedback and stuff. And then they just like get these feedback things going. And then by one by one, they would just all leave the stage. There was four of them. They would leave the stage and it would just be the, in the instruments up there, like playing themselves for like the next 10 minutes. It was a pretty impressive way to end a, a show. Um, I can't believe you guys, I forget. You know, Sorry, man. I wasn't into young, I, young and innocent. You are. I was you never into punk rock, man. <laughs> Especially not hippie punk Especially rock. not, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Were they wearing Especially flowery not. clothes and stuff? And... 
Dark flowers. Dark, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, was man, that Iggy Stooges, Pop or know? was that? A yeah, series, that was a, a, Iggy Pop, right? Yeah, okay, yeah, Brad. Okay. Yeah, all right, Brad. You get a thumbs yeah. up for it. Inevitably, you. every time we we hang out and we have a conversation, you mention something that we know nothing about, and then we just get shamed for it. <laughs> <laughs> See, look, <laughs> what can I say? <laughs> this is history, man. <laughs> I mean, you're you're you're. you're your comprehension of history is is deficient if you don't know about Iggy and the Stooges, <laughs> right? <laughs> Damn it! No. Uh, anyways, uh, yeah, I have stories I could tell about those, uh, but I'm not going to get into that. So we have one more question, or the moon, the moon, the moon. The Everybody moon, the wants moon, to talk moon. about the moon. That's right. There's been a thousand <sighs> moon comments. We'll have to do this sometime, you know. <laughs> Yeah, we'll, well, we'll have to do something on the moon one day. Brad, Bradley, and I, or no, maybe it's you. Look, and I, it's Russ. just not. This is not your fault. It's the chat room's fault because you know we're an hour in when they start blazing the moon situation. Well, <laughs> real Russ, hard, Russell. We're going to have to do a Randall reveals. Sure, Ooh. I'm down. Yeah, we're we're an R and R, and I've got something juicy to share. All right. Um. Yeah. So we should do that sh- soon. Okay. Yeah. You just let me know. Well, I'll go ahead and I, there's a bunch more here. Thanks to um, <laughs> Ben. Ben. This guy. Yeah. Sorry, Ben. For the love of Thank God. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> yeah, he's Thank like, you for tell me about the, the donations, the super chats. That's awesome, people. <laughs> thank you. Yes. Thank you. Uh, Monkey Face, you $12. Uh, hooked on Phonics, tw- 10 bucks. A. I James, did that. $30. Uh, Jidev Parmar, 400 something. Don't know what symbol that is. Uh, Ancient hmm. Sanctum five bucks says, "Where can people follow Brad's work? You can follow that. Where can they follow your work, Brad? Geocosmic Rex, are you still working on that? Woof. They're they're watching it right now. I guess I'm yeah. coordinating and uh, make sure everybody shows up for these things. Yeah, it's uh, Randall Carlson LLC for me, pretty much full time these days. Oh, so okay. I don't. Uh, have much going on uh, my own personal geocosmic rec stuff, but I mean, I've been working with Randall for 25 years now, so uh, it's kind of parallel. Uh, yeah. However, we're, we're talking about uh, an event next spring and I volunteered. I said, Hey, I'm going to speak. If I get to speculate yeah. about some stuff, put me on the list. So, uh, well, I'll say this, you know, this, all this stuff we're doing has my name all over it, but Brad has been a huge, you can't separate anything we're doing here. You know, I'm sort of the face and the big mouth, but like Brad said, he's been a part of this for 25 years now. I mean, where would this be if Brad hadn't had his made his uh, contribution to the everything, you know, so you can't really separate what's happening here from Brad. Take Brad out. It would be a different animal. Yeah, absolutely. That's all I can say. You're oh, following Brad's work is basically what, what, yes, what this, he's saying. This is Brad's work. Uh, yes, because yeah, basically when, when right. Brad and I met and we started having conversations, we realized that, you know, yes, I was ahead of him because I'm a couple of decades older, but he's following the same footprint. I'm footpath that I'm following, asking yeah. the same questions, looking at the same thing, seeking the same kinds of answers. So it was just natural that we formed an alliance. Right. And then you guys met us and found Appreciate out that, that. you had been following And then we met you years. guys and now look. Yeah. <laughs> 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 also, thanks to Benjamin Fairhall and Matthew Edward Meditz. And yes, Dane, I know we didn't quite get to your question there about Jupiter and Saturn. Maybe we can tackle that in a in a different show. Sorry about that. Or Randall, did you want to say something about that, that final question? The Jupiter-Saturn thing? Yes, the Jupiter-Saturn. Yes, I do. Okay. Um, Let's do I that do, and we'll, but... we'll be done. I don't really, I'm not prepared, Okay. but I, I okay. Could. So you're not prepared, but on we our, can do de- it. I tell you what, on our next live stream, we'll look at that. Okay. Ooh. There you go. Dane. It's dangerous, it, dangerous to make yeah. those promises. <laughs> and I, I will take a uh, note. Somebody took a note on that. Somebody write that note. down. Yeah. Last, somebody last in the chat, promise. write it down. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Thanks to the chat. You guys always entertain us yeah, during the show great. and you also make it hard to pay attention to what's really going on. Yeah. So yes. Yes. yes, yes thank you. Ancient I... sanctum. I, I see going by here. I haven't kept up with all this by far, but I see a, a whole lot of work that you're doing to help us out with, with that chat. So thank you. Yes. So yeah. check out her channel. She's putting out great videos. So check that out. Who is ancient sanctum. She's been a, she's the first oh. admin we've had in the chats for the live streams and she's 
usually been here, here every time. Kicking ass. Right. Yeah. Ancient Sanctum. All right. I got to check that out. So, yeah, like I said, the uh, RandallCarlson.com homepage now has uh, ads and uh, or announcements about the sacred geometry class coming up in Nashville. And I thought we might get a chance to watch that. Uh, that three minute video they made uh, that you helped make there, Randall, tonight, but uh, might be too late for that. But uh, it should be linked right there from the homepage, and I'll make sure all these links get in the uh, in the description for this video. Uh, maybe late tonight, but definitely by by tomorrow. So uh, the other Scablands tours coming up. Uh, we have already scheduled another Montana tour for next May. Uh, so if you missed this one, it was excellent. Uh, Going to do it again next year. So. Lots of things a brew. Yeah, lots of things a brew. And uh, yeah, definitely get get news on all that from the Randall Carlson newsletter. Comes out first Saturday every month. Yeah, and we're gonna uh, Sunday after we finish up the uh, the sacred geometry workshop, we're gonna take a little tour of the uh, of the replica of the Parthenon. And one of the things we will do in the workshop is I'm gonna since we're gonna go out and you know, see this, I didn't really appreciate this about nashville but the guys that are organizing this have told me you know that was the original vision of the founders of nashville was that it was going to be kind of the learning center of the south and in fact they they nicknamed it the athens of the south and that's why there is a replica of the parthenon there um just to to sort of reach back across the millennia to to classical greece and sort of forge that connection so uh one of the cool things about the the Parthenon is it's a geodetic monument and I'm going to dive into that um, somewhat in the workshop and uh, uh, and, and by the way we are going and we're not going to we're not going to record the Friday night lecture but we're going to record Saturday and Sunday it's going to be live streamed uh, but then the recording will be available for for purchase after that and anybody who does sign up and gets the live stream you will have uh, the opportunity to, uh, you know, download that in perpetuity. Um, or, you know, if you come in, you don't make the actual live stream broadcast, you can still buy the recording of it, um, you know, up to any, any time afterwards, as long as the world is still here, presumably you'll be able to, uh, to buy that recording. And it's, again, it's going to be sort of an introduction, um, to, the hands-on processes that we will be building upon when we launch, when we uh, relaunch the course this fall, um, where we really do get into a lot of the the deeper sides, the, the deeper dimensions of sacred geometry. So, um, seventy-two bucks, it's a pretty good, pretty good deal. You get about ten hours of concentrated uh, instruction, so that works out. Um, a little more than seven bucks an hour. So, um, but then uh, I'm also putting together a kit of everything that folks will need to participate effectively. And of course, that'll be separate. Um, and you don't have to buy that for the live stream. But if you want to follow along with everything that we're doing, then I highly suggest going ahead and ordering the supply kit. Uh, my brother has put up a, 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 a on Amazon, an Bundle. Amazon store. Yeah. And uh, the good thing is if you get that kit of supplies now, um, you'll have everything you need if you decide you want to actually dive into the course this fall and, you know, get into it in depth. Then you'll have all of the supplies you need on hand because it is hands-on. I mean, so we it really in the initial stages, it involves lots of, a lot of drawing, creating patterns and diagrams and everything and studying their properties and then seeing how those were applied in ancient design all over the world so it's and then with the idea that per, out of that perhaps we would uh, create the potential for people beginning to use this again as a tool you know if you're a landscape architect you want to de design a garden well incorporate a little bit of sacred geometry into it and and then not only create the geometry which is the geometry of beauty and harmony and so on but thou also the integration of the, the form, whether it's a building, a garden, whatever it might be, um, with the cosmic orientation, because that's the second part of the whole system that makes it so powerful, is that you're, you're integrating the geometry, the astronomy, the geodesy um, in, a, in a fully integrated system. And, and um, that's what we're going to try to do. And when we, when we move forward, and we'll have to talk at some point, too, about the, 
um, the, the interest that's growing around the idea of a kind of a platonic Pythagorean type school, um, looking at um, properties up in Tennessee as a potential place. Tennessee seems like this whole thing is quite auspicious because now with the Nashville trip, which just sort of came up at the same time, we're looking at Tennessee as a potential location for the establishment of the first node of the school. Um, then we get contacted by some Nashvillians who are very much involved in the idea of reviving the initial vision of Nashville as a place of learning, a center of learning. So it's some interesting things happening and we'll, we'll, we'll be getting into all of that. But um, so yeah, if, if you're so inclined and you want to get a, a taste of what sacred geometry is about, here's an opportunity coming up in four weeks. And then right that on. can serve as the introduction to the higher levels right. of the stuff that's going to come after. And there's only 60 seats. So I'm not sure how many are gone already because uh, the group up there in Nashville has already been selling it. Um, so, yep. Yeah, time, time is limited and house. you got, you got uh, four weeks and a couple of days before it starts up uh, August 13 and 14. 60 yep. seats for being there in person, but then you can watch it on the you can Correct. Watch it online. Okay. Wide open live stream. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Fantastic. All well, right. Great guys. Great stream guys. Thanks Randall. Thanks Brad. Brad. Randall. Yep. Good stuff. Thanks Randall. everybody in the chats. Thanks Brad. Yes. Thank you snake bros. Yeah. Thanks, thanks guys in the chats. We really appreciate that. Yep. And a lot of these, this money that's come in and is helping keep Brad going. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you. <laughs> More. <laughs> hey, and uh, check out check out fifty dollar dynasty Kyle's band's new yes. album pre session. Uh, awesome, oh, yeah, awesome work you. there, and support them on Patreon. Yeah. Yeah. If you guys like the Cosmographia music for the regular podcast, then that's where to go to find it. Yeah. Fifty dollar dynasty dot com. And quickly yes, mention, you can also support us by. Um, by patronizing CBD from the gods. There you go. Don't forget that. Oh God, my neck was hurting last weekend, and <laughs> Julie gave me a nice neck rub with that CBD salve. I tell you what, it instant relief. All right. Yep. All right. Good night, everybody. Thanks. Good night. Good night. All right. See you Rock next time. Roll. All right.